Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for showing up on this rainy day. And um, this lecture is being recorded for uh, the sake of those of us who could not attend with us today. So um, welcome to all. Uh, those of you who don't know me, my name is Mira Balberg. I'm a faculty member in the history department and also in Jewish studies. And it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Yair Lifshitz of Tel Aviv University, who is, um, I think, the most incredible scholar of Jewish theater uh, currently act uh, active. Uh, his work really spans everything from um, early modern, uh, essentially Renaissance age theater in Italy to contemporary fringe uh, and street performances in uh, Jerusalem. He has written extensively about various playwrights, productions, um, interpretations of the Talmud through uh, theatrical and performative lens. There's really no way to encompass uh, the breadth and the depth and the innovation of his work. Uh, he is the author of the Comedy of Betrothal, which is a, uh, which is the name of the book is um, Holy Tongue Comedy Version. It is a, a fantastic book about the first comedy written in, in Hebrew in the 16th century, of Embodied Tradition, which is uh, a book about the uh, expressions of Jewish themes and Jewish myths in the body of actors and the way in which Jewish uh, traditions and myths change and are transformed through the bodily interpretation of the actor's body. And of Theater and Judaism, which is sort of an introductory book to this entire theme. And he just uh, shared with me yesterday that when he pitched the idea to Pal Gray McMillan, the agent or the you know acquisition editor said, theater and what? Um, so, but this is in a sense, that it is the idea that there actually is a relationship between theater and Judaism, and it's one that's really interesting to explore. So it's really a thrill to have him with us today to share his work, um, which is part of a work, a book in the making about uh, messianism and messianic time in uh, Hebrew theater and Jewish theater. His lecture today is called Queer Messianic Bodies in Modernist Hebrew Theater. Thanks so much for being with us, and the stage is yours. Uh, thank you, Mira, uh, for this uh, too flattering uh, introduction. Uh, and so also thank you for inviting me and hosting me. So thank you to Mahdi for all of her assistance throughout the way. Um, and thank you all for coming in this way. So uh, as Mira said, uh, this is part of uh, a, uh, a project that I'm working on, a book project about uh, messianism, messianic time in Hebrew and in Jewish theater. And specifically, I will talk today about the idea of messianic bodies, uh, which I will elaborate on in a minute. Just the main figure we'll talk about is this person, uh, actress Hannah Rovina uh, from the theater group Abima, here portraying the Messiah itself, himself or herself. We'll talk about that. Um, and what I would like to talk about today is the idea of what kind of body the Messiah has. And as Mila said, I'm, I'm very much interested, interested in uh, theater as an art of the body, as, a, as an art in which the bodies of actors are put on stage. And I'm interested in the way, in the ways in which these bodies somehow correlate with uh, Jewish traditions and themes. And when we think of the Messiah's body, body, then, one interesting dynamic that we see is that, of course, throughout um, Jewish history, it was quite clear that the Messiah has a body. The Messiah is a specific person, and that person will have a body. It doesn't matter who that person will be. The Messiah will arrive in some kind of embodied form. But towards the 19th, late 19th century, you, you, you can see uh, some kind of process in which there is a depersonal, depersonalization of the Messiah, uh, the Messiah is not necessarily a person, it is a movement. Zionism can be messianic, Marxism can be messianic. We actually start sp speaking more and more about the messianic or messianism, and less and less about the Messiah. Uh, so there is a sense of a disembodiment of the messianic idea, uh, 
and it becomes exactly that, the messianic idea, rather than the messiah as a person. However, in the late 19th century, at, at, at exactly at the same time, this is a time when Jewish cultures begin to have theater. It's a rather modern phenomenon in Jewish societies. Uh, and a lot of that theater discusses messianic scenes and puts on stage messianic figures. So exactly at the time when the idea that the Messiah has a body is kind of dwindling in modern Jewish discourse, it there is a new opportunity of encountering the Messiah's body in the theater and, and questioning again, what, what does it mean that the Messiah has such a body? So before we'll talk about theater, I do want to start with a non-theatrical embodiment of the Messiah, <laughs> this bronze uh, sculpture from 1905, uh, by Henrik Glitzenstein, Bar Kochva. Bar Kochva is the leader of uh, the second century rebellion against the, the Jewish rebellion against the Romans uh, in the second century. And um, according to some, it's debatable, was considered to be some kind of claimant to the role of Messiah and Redeemer of the Jews. Uh, the, the redemption failed miserably and had catastrophic events, so uh, uh, consequences. So, uh, um, his messianic role is debatable, but what I would like to look at in this uh, sculpture is Bar Kochba's body, and just note that once we ask ourselves how the Messiah is embodied, or how we imagine uh, the Messiah's body in modern arts, whether theater or in this case, uh, sculpture, we all we have to think about two questions. One, one is, how do we understand redemption? What kind of redemption? and in what kind of body. So the specific ideologies of the body uh, at a specific time, at a specific moment, within a specific social circle are intersecting with whatever image of redemption one has. And this image of Bar Kuchva, the muscular, uh, masculine uh, figure of a Jewish uh, warrior as a messianic figure, uh, obviously, connects the notion of redemption with a very specific body, what usually would be considered, uh, we talked about the body of the new Jew, uh, a Jew that is athletic, that uh, can fight, that is not just spiritual or intellectual, um, that is not diasporic, but fights for a sovereignty. And this is embodied in this kind of body. So I'm just giving this as some kind of background uh, in order to look at a very different kind of body that uh, um, was offered by this theater group, Abima, which is a Hebrew theater group, Hebrew speaking theater group that was established in Russia in 1917 by Nachum Tzemach, who's sitting there at the center, uh, and two of his co founders, Hanna Vovina, we saw her in the first, um, uh, the beginning of the presentation uh, as the Messiah, and Menachem Kimesim. Um, this trio uh, established a Hebrew-speaking theater group uh, in Russia, which at the time I would say was a crazy idea. There were hardly any Hebrew-speaking actors. There are hardly any Hebrew hearing audiences. Uh, it's not a spoken language at all. And uh, there are also hardly any Hebrew plays, written plays, we'll talk about that in a minute. But that was the vision. The vision was to have uh, a Hebrew-speaking theater. Uh, they get the blessings of, of one Konstantin Stanislavski, uh, greatest uh, theater director in Russia at the time, uh, and, and he attaches this group with uh, his protege, an Armenian non-Jewish director by, by the name of Evgeny Bakhtango, and uh, they start working, and during the 20s, they put up a series of plays which, which achieve international, both local Russian and intellectual international success, both among Jewish and non-Jewish audiences, uh, and they become perhaps, they're not the first Hebrew-speaking theater group, but perhaps the first internationally successful Hebrew theater speaking group. Uh, they will travel uh, in Europe, in the United States throughout the 20s, and ultimately in the early 30s, uh, will settle in Tel Aviv, but I will talk about their 20s and their um, the kind of theater that they uh, did uh, at the time. Specifically, we'll talk about this play, The Golem, from 1925, one of the th first three uh, important plays staged by Abima. 
as I said earlier, uh, we have a Hebrew speaking uh, group uh, with actors, we Hebrew speak, sorry, Hebrew speaking actors, but they, but there aren't hardly any Hebrew uh, Hebrew plays uh, that were originally written in Hebrew. There aren't plays that at least are considered stage worthy. So the early repertoire of Abima was mainly from the Yiddish, tra a place translated from the Yiddish uh, into Hebrew. One of them is the Golem, which was written by uh, Leivik, H. Leivik, um, um, one of the central Yiddish poets and playwrights of, of the time. I will say a few words about the play, although I would mainly want to speak about Habima's uh, production of the play. Um, the play takes, maybe we'll go back to, to the golden stuff. Uh, the play takes place in the 16th century Prague and actually follows at the time, uh, uh, a story that was already quite popular at Levick's time of the Golem of Prague, according to which Rabbi Yehuda Lev of Prague, the Maharal, usually known as the Maharal, creates a golem, uh, an artificial humanoid out of clay, in order to protect um, the Jews from the persecution of their neighbors. And the golem is, uh, does that. He is uh, a strong, we'll soon, soon see this, a, a strong, violent uh, machine of, of self-protection, but he also yearns for some spiritual guidance from the Maharal. The Maharal uh, denies him that because he thinks that the golem needs to be just a killing machine. Uh, and at one point, the golem's violence is, is, is turned in, uh, towards the Jewish community itself. He starts being violent towards the Jewish community, and the play ends with the Maharal understanding he needs to neutralize the golem or to some degree uh, kill it. So Leivik writes this play um, when he's already in New York. Uh, Leivik was uh, a prisoner in Siberia in Tsarist Russia. He, uh, he was active in socialist circles. He escapes Russia to New York, and he writes the play following the Bolshevik Revolution um, as some, I would say, um, way of meditating about the price of a violent revolution. So if you think of the golem as some kind of violent uh, means of redemption, a way of somehow uh, changing the world uh, through physical force, this being written uh, in the aftermath of the Bolshevik revolution is, is some kind of way for Levick to, to tackle um, what kind of price these kind of re revolutions might uh, might uh, entail. Specifically, if we look at the question of the golem, uh, of the body, uh, the golem is a very bodily creature in the play. So here we have the Maharal, when he first creates the golem and he creates this gig gigantic humanoid, uh, and he says about him, yeah, is this the man I dreamed uh, into existence, my champion, my envoy? He, such arms, such legs, such shoulders, so much body, flesh. There is some kind of uh, um, expression of, here of the golem as pure body, a huge body and pure body, which the Maharal is somehow feeling uh, at least some sense of alienation from, or some sense of distance from, saying, how could I create this kind of bodily um, existence, pure bodily existence? The golem himself thinks of the Maharal, uh, when, when the golem himself responds to the Maharal, we see that there is, uh, the golem considers his own body to be some kind of opposite image of the Maharal. Yes, yeah, so he says, your beard, is, your beard is long and white, and mine is black, you're very small and very old compared with me. Yes, and your head is very tiny. You talk to me and tremble all the while, and all the while your hands are shivering. So we have already two bodies here which are put uh, one in opposition to the other. One is of the old rabbi, of the old Jewish rabbi, who is white and tiny and shivering and weak. And as opposed to that is the golem as this huge mas um, mas masculine and muscular body uh, that uh, that stands in opposition to the rabbi. We'll return to this opposition in a minute, but what I would just want to kind of look at is the way that already in Leivik's text, even before the Bima, uh, Abima 
starts uh, staging it, uh, the question of the body becomes uh, central, and and the uh, uh, and the golem is already presented as a different kind of body than the body of the representative of the Jewish community, the Ma'ara. So there, it's a body that is created by a, a Jewish rabbi, but is also different from the Jewish rabbi. We'll return to this in a minute. This body, one last thing about the golem's body, this body is also, uh, as I said, I would say masculine, but also toxically masculine or, or, or violently masculine. Uh, one, of the, um, one of the problems that uh, emerges throughout the play is that the golem is very attracted to the Maharal's daughter or granddaughter. <laughs> There's some questions there, uh, Deborah, uh, and actually starts some kind of predatory um, 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 relationship with her. She tries to avoid him. He kind of he 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 chases her, uh, and yeah, you can see the text. We don't have to read it, but uh, uh, there's a, there is a long text in which he expresses his desire in a way which is uh, threatening and violent. And this is actually what causes the Maharal to finally kill the golem when this becomes a threat to his granddaughter. So there is there is also a way in which this body is kind of a branded as um, masculine, but in a threatening way. So we have force, we have uh, a, a strong sense of bodiliness, but also one that is gendered as masculine in a strong sense. Okay. As opposed to the golem, and this is where the Messiah comes in, as opposed to the golem, we have the Messiah itself. Because at one point in the play, uh, the Messiah arrives to prom. The Messiah arrives to Prague uh, and the Maharal meets the Messiah and recognizes the Messiah. Uh, and one would have expected that the Maharal would be very happy that the Messiah is here. But what is interesting is that at this specific moment, the Maharal decides, decides to banish the, uh, the Messiah from Prague. And what he says is, yeah, he, uh, he has to live, the Messiah has to leave. Uh, he can't stay in our in our realm, and can his fingers coil in, in iron fists and crash and bash and smash and shudder shudder skull shatter skulls, and can he even stand a stench of blood and spill it? And can he exact a, a tooth for every tooth, an eye for every eye, a head for every head? And can his hands, his delicate hands, scratch in the filth of pits, looking for limbs, looking for bones and ashes? His hands cannot, and even if they could. I'd be against it. He must be the last. So in this very remarkable um, monologue, the Mahal makes a, a, a crucial historical decision in which he says the kind of redemption that the Messiah has to offer is one that is not ready for this time. What is the kind of redemption that this time entails is a violent one, and this is gruesomely violent in this moment, right? Yeah, it's described in gruesomely violent terms. And the Messiah should not be that per the person doing that. And even if the Messiah wants to be the person doing that, the Maharal will not allow him to be that person. And the last words here, which I think are important, is that the Messiah has to be the last. The Messiah has to become at the end of his, to arrive at the end of history, be the last redeemer of all. So we have here, a very um, specific vision of history and of time in which, according to the Maharal, the redeemer of the present, of what, of what is needed now, is the golem. And what, and what is needed now is violence, shattering skulls, dealing with blood, being revengeful. That is the kind of redemption that the Maharal thinks is needed at the moment, and that kind of redemption is the one of the golem. And there is another redemption, which is the redemption of the future, not of the present, but of the future of the Messiah that has to be the last. And that would be delicate and peaceful and spiritual, maybe, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So we actually have here, according to the Maral, two different kinds of redeemers, two different kinds of messiahs, if we want. One, which is the Messiah or the redeemer of the present, of violence, of force, of blood, uh, and another, another of the future, of peace, of, delic uh, of delicate hands, uh, and of spirituality. And the Messiah makes a choice. 
and the Maharal makes a decision. And the decision is that this is the wrong time for the, so for the Messiah. And as I said, he banishes him. Now, just to, to put like to note that the play ends, of course, with tragedy because the golem you know, goes out of control and needs to be neutralized. So uh, at the end of the day, we might want to ask whether the Maharal made the right choice. He, did, did he interpret history correctly at this specific moment? Or maybe this was actually the Maharal's tragic mistake of banishing the Messiah um, out of Prague. But this is but this is the choice that he had made nonetheless. And with that, with this choice, I would like to see how how Obima um, chose to embody this specific Messiah and what they had to say about that. In order to do, this, to do this, I want to look at just one more point from the play, and this is the way that the Messiah himself is depicted in Leivik's uh, stage directions. Um, so the stage directions claim, uh, say, Hush, young beg uh, the young beggar, which is the Messiah, who is uh, disguised as a young uh, beggar, sits down on the floor and starts unbinding his sores. He unwinds uh, and unwinds the rags on his feet and winds them again, all uh, watch the young beggar by, uh, bind his source, right? And this, so we already have here a figure which is a very uh, charged fig uh, visual figure of the Messiah as a young beggar binding and unbinding his source. Before we even kind of unpack this, we can already see that as opposed to the golem who is his physical strength and uh, uh, and muscles, etc., uh, the young beggar slash the Messiah is weak and wounded and already offers us a very different kind of bodily image. This, the idea of the Messiah as a beggar who uh, binds and unbinds the, uh, uh, the bandages on their feet uh, is specifically taken from the Talmud. I will not read all of it uh, right, right now because uh, we don't have much time, but uh, from a Talmudic story in which uh, Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi is, meets Elijah the prophet prophet uh, and asks him when the messiah the, when will the messiah arrive elijah says to him well you can just go and ask him yourself he sits at the gates of rome among the beggars and the, you will recognize him because all the beggars uh and when they un, uh, unbind when they change their bandages on their sores they do it all they unbind all the uh, bandages at once and then they bind all of them and the Messiah is uh, binding them one at a time. So uh, you can really see where Levi takes this image from. Uh, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi uh, goes to the Messiah um, and, um, and, and, and meets him. And then when he asks him, when are you going to arrive? The, the Messiah, this is in the Talmudic story, uh, the Messiah says to him, I'm going to arrive today. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi says, okay, this is a lie. He goes to, Rabbi, to back to Elijah the prophet and says, the Messiah lied to me because he said he's going to arrive today. And Elijah the prophet uh, interprets uh, the Messiah's words and says what he meant is he's going to arrive today. There's a, a verse from Solomon's, today, if you will listen to his voice. He would have arrived today if all the Jews were just observing God's command. I, will, I, I, I want to return to, to Stalin this for a moment because... The, the, if we look at the body of the Messiah in the Talmudic story itself, this body already has a very interesting relation to time. On the one hand, this Messiah can arrive today. So there is a sense that the Messiah can arrive at the present in every given moment. But according to Elijah, it's today only if everyone will observe God's commandment. So there is a sense that this present moment of today is endlessly postponed. It could have been today, but it's not today. There is a sense in which the present is always delayed, deferred to another, to some undisclosed future. And this is also marked in the Messiah's body, if I return to the first part of the story, with this act of the bandaging of the, uh, of the sores of the, uh, on the body, because while all the other beggars are unwinding all of their bandages and then they're winding them back again, so there's a sense of like, a cyclical continuum of a never-ending time, the Messiah changes each bandage uh, at a time because, there's, or you hope the, as, the, as the Talmud explains it, he thinks, I might be called upon to uh, to save the Jews right now, so I, I need to be ready, so I will I will 
I will just change uh, each bandage, uh, each bandage, bandage at a time. So there is a sense in which the Messiah's own sense of time, own sense of present, is that every single moment can be that moment. I can arrive today, and then okay, I will have to wrap the next bandage because it doesn't happen now. So there is on the one hand a very charged sense of the present. But this present is always somehow in tension with the future uh, that should arrive but doesn't arrive, as opposed to the way that the other beggars are experiencing time, which is a never-ending cycle of winding and unwinding, binding and unbinding. So that Messiah's body is a body that already has a very unique position in time in the sense that there is the present is a very charged moment, but it's always a moment of expectation of something that could happen, of a future that could arrive, but didn't. So if we return back to Levick's play, the fact that Levick uses this image and kind of shifts it from the gates of Rome to 16th century Prague, he turns the, the Messiah's body not just to a body that is weak and wounded uh, as opposed to the golem's body, but if again, if the golem's body is the body that, uh, is supposed to, to be the, the redeemer of the present, according to the Maharal, the Messiah's body is the Messiah in which the present has some kind of redemptive potential, but this redemptive potential is always lost. So there, there's a, some kind of a more, I would say, there's some kind of more, uh, there's a dual, a, 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 a double temporality in the Messiah's body. It is a body that has some claim on the present and doesn't have a and doesn't have a claim on the present at the same time, as opposed to the Golem's body, which is a body that has a claim only on the present in some kind of full sense of uh, uh, of redemption. Okay, so we'll move. Where are we? Okay. This is weird. The pictures disappeared from the. <laughs> okay. Okay, we work with what we have. Um, uh, moving from Levick's play to Habima's performance, um, I would like to uh, take a look at the way that Habima chose to embody these characters of the Golem and the Messiah by the actual bodies of the players, the actors that they chose for the role. I would say beforehand that Habima um, shortened Leivik's play, which is a very long and poetic and symbolic play. They shortened it into a much shorter version. And they also made it uh, a far more national play. Um, so as I said earlier, Leivik, Leivik's play is some kind of meditation about revolution and redemption within, in the context of, let's say, a universal Bolshevik revolution, uh, or at least a universally aspiring Bolshevik revolution. But uh, for Habima, the questions were much more national in their scope. For example, in Levik's play, uh, the golem is called Yossel, which is a Yiddishized and uh, diminutive uh, version of the name Joseph. Uh, in Habima's Hebrew version, he's called Yehuda, which is Judah, which is a far more uh, nationally charged name. And Levik, which saw this, perform this uh, performance, did not like this adaptation at all. Uh, 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 at least according to uh, reports. And part of, so so we, we are, the context is a context of, of a national redemption rather than a universal redemption. And part of this question, the part of the national redemption uh, aspect of it has to do with the choices of casting. So in the photo that you cannot see for some reason, which is over there, you would have seen actor, actor Ahawan Meski. Uh, who is uh, the actor who was chose to play the character of uh, the golem. And Meskin was uh, uh, a soldier in the Red Army, a soldier in the Russian army before he became an actor. He was tall, he was broad-shouldered, he had a very deep bo voice, so there was something in his physique which already uh, um, was lent himself easily to the role of the golem. And he, his height was also heightened by adding boots and, and other mechanical device, uh, costume devices to kind of make him look uh, much taller. There should have been a picture there to show that, but you can imagine it. 
and there's nothing here as well. Okay, uh, but you can see him here as opposed to the uh, actor who plays the Maharal, which is Baruch Shemrinsky, and you can see that the, there is the, the bodily opposition that we see already in Avik's text is manifested quite clearly uh, through the tension between the golem as this broad, high physique and the Maharal in his stooped uh, old physique. And we already kind of have here what for definitely for early 20th century Jewish audiences would be easily recogni be recognizable as um, the new Jew versus the old Jew, right? So we have the rabbi representing spiritual knowledge, intellectual knowledge, uh, a leader of a diasporic exilic community uh, and presented as being old and withered uh, and stooped. And we have this new athletic, strong, um, uh, played by uh, an ex-soldier soldier from the army uh, figure of the golem who represents a new kind of uh, Jewish uh, physicality. This is, I would say, just uh, as a note, this is not that clear-cut even within Habima's production. Again, two photos disappeared, but you can see a bit here the golem's makeup, which has been... Uh, been he, uh, Meskin was... Um, uh, used very white way makeup with red around the eyes, which made him look a bit like a big baby or like a clown. So this, this is not just masculine physicality, uh, a clear cut kind of image of, of, of grown masculine physicality. The golem is also a child. He's also infantilized to some degree. He's also a bit of a buffoon. His, his uh, Meskin's uh, acting was comic. There was nothing comic in Levick's play, uh, but the production kind of veered towards something uh, 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 clownish in, in the Golem's uh, performance. So even this new Jew masculinity is a bit questioned uh, through Meskin's performance. And again, we can also say that at the end of the day, the golem fails, right? The play is about the death of the or the tragedy of the of, of the of the golem's failure or or death. For um for the role of the Messiah, uh let's take the early for the role of the Messiah, um Habima chose a really unique and interesting the casting choice, and that is Hanna Rovina, actor, actress Hanna Rovina, who was already the by the time the Golem uh, started uh, um, premiered, uh, was the um, the most successful female actor in Habima at the time, and um, this choice of using a female actor to play the Messiah is in itself noteworthy, and I would like to kind of focus on that and perhaps explain why we're talking about queer messianic bodies. So if we go back to, oh my God, something's wrong. Okay, so I will say, and again, you'll have to believe me in this, uh, the, um, the practice of, of casting uh, female actors to male, to male uh, part, uh, roles was uh, not very common at the early 20th century. You wouldn't see a lot of this cross-gender um, casting that today are, is much more common. You would usually see uh, female actors playing male roles in two, uh, um, usually in two kinds of roles. One is um, young, melancholic, and tragic men, such as Hamlet, which was a role that was played by several actresses at the time, including Sarah Bernal, which is not here. Uh, so tragic and melancholic young men or male characters who are not exactly human, but are more um, fairies or spirits and are not exactly material, such as Ariel in uh, The Tempest of Shakespeare or Peter Pan. Um, so, and so the choice of casting uh, a female actor for the role of the Messiah to some degree follows the, this logic as well. The Messiah in this play is a tragic, melancholic young man, and he's also not exactly a person, but rather something which is more spiritual. More spiritual. The idea of casting a woman in the role uh, of the Messiah is perhaps a way of contrasting the Messiah 
with the physicality of the golem. If the golem is pure body and also pure masculinity, as it is uh, performed by uh, Meskin, then the Messiah is spiritual. And the way that perhaps we can kind of mark the Messiah as spiritual is through casting a woman to this realm. However, we can add another layer to that by looking at Hannah Rovina's earlier roles in Habima's repertoire. And one of them was the Messiah's mother in uh, Habima's production of another Yiddish play, David Pinsky's uh, The Eternal Jew. The Eternal Jew is an adaptation of a Talmudic story about how the Messiah was born at the day of the temple's destruction. Uh, and there is a wandering Jew who is the eternal Jew who goes and comes into a village and meets the Messiah's mother. So uh, Elchan Rovina played the Messiah's mother there. So, you know, it's just it's an upgrade. She was the Messiah's mother and the eternal Jew, and the next one she's the Messiah himself. That makes sense. Uh, but her most famous role was Leah in uh, Hannah Rovina, uh, in S. In Anstis, the Dibuk, book, which was the role that made her a star. And this role seemingly doesn't have any messianic connotations, although I hope we will get a chance to see that actually it does a bit. Uh, the Dibuk taught, uh, tells the story of a young Jewish maiden named Leah, uh, who um, is in love with a young Jewish man named Honan, and he is in love with her. Uh, however, she is um, betrothed to another man, a richer man. Uh, and Honan, who is dabbling with Kabbalah, um, tries to use some kind of mystical, magical means to force God to give Leah to him, to him, and he dies in the process. But he returns as a dibuk, as a dead, as a dead uh, spirit that possesses her body in her wedding. And the rest of the play is an attempt to uh, exorcise the dibuk out of Leah's body, um, which ends also in failure. I mean the. The Dibuk leave, leaves her body, but then at the end of the play, Leah chooses to die and join him in death. And I'm, I'm specifically uh, um, pointing to this role, again, not just because it's uh, Rovina's most important role, but because in that role as, um, as Leah possessed by a Dibuk, Hannah Rovina uh, uh, achieved a feat which in some ways made her a superstar. And that was being able to speak in a male voice uh, as the dead Honan that speaks from her from her body. So the part of the part of the ways in which the Dibuk is performed or is manifested is that the woman afflicted by the Dibuk speaks in a male in a male voice. And Habima's and, and Rovina's uh, success, or at least part of like the spectacle of Rovina at the time, was Give allowing to a male voice to somehow emerge from her um, female body, and this is to some degree what she does later as the Messiah as well. So there is some kind of connection here which I want to look at, which is that this cross-dressing role in which there is some kind of androgyny, some kind of um, a body that is bi-gendered that has two genders within one body that connects. Rovina's performance as the Messiah with her, with her earlier, much more famous performance as Leah. And of course, at the time, and again, he was here on one, but at the time, uh, Habima would play just, uh, would play uh, the deep book and the golem side by side, so audiences would have the opportunity to see it, um, to see these two to uh, roles one next to the other, one evening after the other, and make these connections. What I want to suggest is that, we'll go back to here, what I want to suggest is that um, what Rovina achieves in her role as Leah has very much to do with what she achieves in her role as, in her role as the Messiah. And this is not just about having a body that is bi-gendered, both male, both female, but also a body that is bi-temporal, that is, has both two times within it. Because part of what's happening with the Dibuk, when the dead body enters the, the living person, in this case, Leah, we have the past 
somehow refusing to let go of the past or become past and clinging to the present. The actual meaning of the word debuk is clinging or cleaving, uh, clinging to the present and creating a body in which present and past intermingle. And this intermingling of times is, uh, in, is bodied forth by a body which is both male and female. So the fact that this body transgresses the border, the, um, the borderline, the boundaries of, of traditional gender norms is also a transgression of times and a body that brings forth more than one time. It's not just the present, but it's also another time that somehow comes to be present in the present. So in the Dibuk, Leah does this, Vovina does this uh, with relation to the past, and in her role in the Golem as the Messiah, uh, she does it with relation to the future. If we return to the idea of today, but only if you, know, you will uh, obey his commandments, or the idea of, uh, of the bandages, Rovina's Messiah's role is in itself uh, both a bi-gendered and a bi-temporal role. It is male and female, but it is also present and not past, but future. It is the future that somehow tries to enter into the present and is actually um, denied access by, by the Maharal. So what, Le what Rovina does here, and this is where I would like to offer the idea of the queer messianic, is that as opposed to Meskin's golem, which again is, is a very masculine figure, but it is, it is also a figure of the present, Rovina's role of the Messiah is subverting both gender norms, but also temporal norms and their norms. And there's a sense here in which the messianic is queer to the degree that there is some kind of disruption here. So, in this entirely <laughs> empty uh, uh, um, um, uh, slide, uh, you should you would have seen several uh, key books in the recent in recent years uh, that this, that offer this notion of queer temporalities, which is uh, a theoretical framework according to which um, queer experience can somehow undermine some temporal frameworks. Or what we can call a straight, straight or straightforward linear time. So we have several theoretic, uh, theoretical works by Lee Edelman and, and Elizabeth Friedman and others that suggest that as opposed to a linear uh, um, trajectory of time in which the past is then supplanted, super, super, uh, superseded by the, the present and then by the future uh, in some kind of linear way, queer experience of, of time somehow um, uh, and settle that in ways that are that offer us other ways of thinking about about the way that the time works and, and the present is not necessarily always the present there's a question about where the future is leading there are several issues going on there I will not elaborate at the moment but I do I want to suggest here that there is a sense in which um the the Rovina's performance as the Messiah offers some kind of queer temporality in the sense that the present is never just the present itself. It's also a time in which some other some other kind of time manifests itself through. So, and I think this is actually a very radical notion that Abima puts forward here. Oh, again, I'm not sure that he meant it, but, but there is perhaps a way of, of analyzing Abima in a way, especially at the time, if we return back to Bar Kochva, Here we are. Especially at the time when this kind of body was considered the, the, the normative redemptive body, a, a masculine and muscular physical um, warrior kind of body. This is the body that will bring redemption. Um, offering the Messiah as this queer figure that actually unsettles our sense of time, our sense of presence, of, of the present, but also our sense of gender is actually a quite a different and a radical way of thinking about what redemption is or what messianic time is. And to some degree, by, by uh, casting Rovina as this Dibuk messianic figure 
that transgresses uh, transgresses gender, but also tra transgresses time, uh, Habima offers us to think that there is something queer in the experience of messianic time, uh, and that our notion of redemption might be not about a straightforward present, but actually in a present that is subverted or um, penetrated, if we wish, by other temporalities. What's up, everyone? Thank you so much for your the amazing um, of grace under critical uh, circumstances. <laughs> I haven't thought of a connection with like, all my thoughts that are sitting there. All of our works are somehow, we're, we're in this resonating with this, so I'm sure you guys have questions for you. If you're willing to take some of those. Yeah. Is just so incredible the pouring yeah. into the resistance. And I wonder if um, if you're thinking at all about voice and embodiment more more um because that sort of I don't know the chance of the translations, but that's on the list of the voice and then this sort of you know, I didn't know about did it um sort of change voice, but can we see you know how we taking advantage of that? Range to sort of achieve the, the yes, thank you for that. So, um, for sure. I mean, I think first of all, if you, there are have some, there are some recordings of Govina, with, and are, they are stunning in every way. And she was a very strong vocal performer. Um, and I think first of all, I would say on one layer before we even enter Govina specifically. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is a theater which speaks Hebrew with actors and audiences of, where Hebrew is not their first language and sometimes not their language at all. So one of the questions is how to make Hebrew evocative in ways which are not just the meanings of the words. So some of the audience will get the meaning because they might get Hebrew to some degree, but how you can create a uh, new experience in which Hebrew works in other layers as well. And vocal performance, sorry, vocal performance becomes a very, very important aspect of that. The musicality of the language, the, uh, a little, the, the sensory dimensions of it are, are very strong in Abima's earlier performances, which are indeed very less literal to some degree, less, it's less about I'm saying words and you know the, uh, the people in the audience understand what I say, but I use language in a much more I don't know, say plastic way, in a much more sensitive way. So that's true for Abima at large. And, and Rovina um, excelled in that. And prior even to the, in the Eternal Jewish, she really had this monologue, which is stunning. But even prior to that, in the Dibuk, book, part of what really made her a star is that there is a moment in which the Dibuk book first is revealed. And this is, she stands under the chupa, under the, uh, um, in, in her wedding and she rejects her to be husband and the voice that comes from her is considered to be a male voice now it's actually quite I'm not sure let's see if we have that uh, that one if it survived no it did not but um, the, the, at the, the first production of Abima of the Dibuk the first cast Juan and her beloved was also act, uh, portrayed by an actress, Miriam Elias. So we actually have her male lover was also a cross-dressing girl. So she was impersonating the male voice of another actress who was impersonating the male voice. So this was really interesting in the way this kind of uh, worked gender-wise. After Miriam Elias left Abima, uh, that role became a, a role for male actors. So it became less less queer to some degree. Um, but yes, even then, the the idea of vocal performance was really important for, for Lovina's success. And I think there is something um, on the tension between voice and body, right? So the a male voice and a female body or, or, uh, or the material body versus the immaterial voice that works very strongly here. So to to so the voice is on the one hand a bodily function, but then there's something kind of not 
disembodied in the voice that works very strongly in the idea of the in the deep definitely of, of a body with with a spirit that comes from you know that is from it's a soul that is not this body's soul uh that that this 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 tension between body and voice it becomes really crucial to kind of give give expression to that yeah 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 let's <laughs> let's see, like look at something we can see yes Oh, um, I need. It. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's a, no. There is there. There's. A, it's a major cross dressing. Go. Right. Who played? I need to check who played viola in, in that. Just... Yeah, actually, I, I mean, I totally skipped that. But I really should check it. Who played viola? It. It. it I, I mean, it. It could be Vogna. I need to check it out. Who did it? Thank you. Yeah. That's a great idea. Um, I'm thinking of there's a play which I just recently discovered, and I'm even not by a, a, a young Yiddish writer. Maybe you can Ben Yush Steiman. Does this mean the bell? So he was a young playwright. He died like at the age of 23 or something, and he wrote a play called Messiah, Son of Yosef, and it's a very strange play, a short play. Uh, like a one act play in which uh, Lilith uh, is controlling the world and um, it's like a it's a dystopic kind of play uh, it's a future in which everybody are under Lilith's reign and the messiah arrives and she tries to convince every what what happens if she tries to seduce the messiah the messiah refuses to be seduced as much as I can tell from that play and then she actually she um um malicious thoughts. She uh, sends um yeah, it's, it's like she 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 sends the masses against the Messiah and they and they and they kill the Messiah. So uh so there the Lilith is a very strong anti-messianic figure uh in that play, and uh one which uh on the one hand is, you know, put in some kind of heterosexual, maybe desire to them towards the Messiah, but, but also subverts that and actually brings down, brings his down. So I think there is a sense of, um, you can think of Lilith as, as this kind of queer or gender disrupting figure, even within the context, even in that play of, of, Messi of, of the, of, of, of the Messianic. Um, I think with, uh, um, Leah specifically, I'm not sure about the other roles of Malkovina, but with Leah, there is always a question in that play of the demonic, right? That that she might be that the power that possesses her is 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 a demonic power, or to some degree. And there's uh, especially in Abima's performance, she is. Um, there are beggars again. There's a lot of beggars in this, uh, which have a role of somehow. Uh, shoving the book into her and their performance was extremely grotesque and demonic as some kind of oops, as some kind of force that brings the book into Leia. so not necessarily lilith but the queer and the demonic do play a role here together in in, in the book in late in the other plays maybe less so but there there for sure yes yeah and i Thoughts going in different directions, but the one that keeps kind of yeah, nudging at me is this Hegelian idea of like history repeating itself, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking about the two versions of the Messiah, not the, yeah. but the the Messiah of the Golo. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering whether there's this earnest messiah that one must wait for a long time 
And then there's the Golan, which is, you know, it's certainly the latest reading, the Messiah that was created as a kind of parody of mm -hmm. the real Messiah, which is grotesque and made by humans. And for later, it probably looks a little bit like Zionism. For others, it may have looked like the Soviet Union, but yeah. this idea that, you know, we're supposed to wait, but we didn't wait. And so we did Golan instead of Messiah, the Messiah, the Messiah. I wonder how that squares with the the queer reading of the Messiah, the sort of, you know, the queer acting through a female of the actual Messiah creates sort of other world figure that yeah. isn't so grotesque as yeah. like a human, as yeah. a human or, or I don't know. Yeah, so thank you. Sure. So I, I'm thinking, um, well, we'll have this. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking, there's one strand of thought which I didn't, didn't develop here, but I'm thinking about in which the golem is also a queer figure to some degree because he is a caricature of masculinity, and this is what what it kind of hinted at with the white makeup and the and the baby kind baby like kind of uh, um, demeanor and the comic aspects of of the character, which is much more Habima's than Levik's in this sense. I mean, Levik Levik's play is not funny, but Habima was. Abimus production was, uh, and I think there is also a sense of thinking of the golem as a as a queer caricature of masculinity because we actually do not have here like normative straight masculinity in, in either of these performances. So the, the Messiah for sure, but the golem who's supposed to represent some kind of present centered focused uh, masculinity is also a buffoon and a baby. So it's it's not a it's not like a man in you know like whatever ideal of a man should be so there is a sense i agree that even that is being parodied and queered so that when you look in a beam on in a beam on in a beam of stage there isn't really one appealing like straight option of of, of gender or of redemption so i i hope this kind of yeah. connects what you're saying the other sure And taught chocolates for the war, mm -hmm. which is, you know, also from some yeah. from the yeah. same time. And, uh, yes. and it's also by the, right, it's mm -hmm. by the ones yeah. that are full of right. Story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think they. I don't think they stage Chapik at the time. I mean, the Prague connection is really very interesting, and the connection between the golem and robots, robots and and puppetry at the time, which is also a very uh, a central Prague uh, endeavor. Um, but so it's definitely like the Prague connection is important, but I'm not sure Abima picked up on that to my to my knowledge. Yeah, sorry. So <laughs> although I think that she um uh did fit into the or or did their lives while making it happen a little bit. In other production, but even so, because of the nature of the law of science, would it still be together as much for justice? Yeah, it's 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 a great question. Thank you. I mean. It I would I think yes. I mean, I, I don't see it's very interesting because um if it I I I I haven't found any um responses like in reviews or I don't know memoirs or whatever uh, that this has been a controversial choice which is interesting because in, you know from, from a traditional jewish point of view this is crazy <laughs> uh nobody i mean i, I don't recall uh, a, a female messiah prior to that maybe there's something i'm missing uh 
Um, so, and I can, I have some, I have some thoughts which are a bit disorganized about this, but part of it is that, and this is also has to do with this kind of um, um, non-symmetrical way in the early 20th century theater that uh, female actors playing male roles were treated as, as opposed to male actors playing female roles. So uh, a bit after that, um, Bima performs a, a, a play by Sholem Alechem, by Yiddish writer of Sholem Alechem, and Meskin, who plays the Golem Hill, plays there a Jewish woman. And everybody writes about that. And it's like, and it's, it, it draws a lot of attention and, it, and it's comic and it's grotesque and it's, and you, and in the, in memoirs of people, you find a lot of attention to that. It's like a big thing. And there's almost nothing about Rovina's portrayal, portrayal of the Messiah in the same way. And it's, it's really interesting to see how the cross-dressing role of a man in a, in, in a, in a female role is kind of. I don't know, perhaps evoke some kind of maybe anxiety or an easiness or something. You cannot ignore that this is a, a man playing a woman while um, there is some sense, which I think is unjustified and also does, I think there's it's much richer than that, but as if Rovina disappears or the actress disappears into a role and we're not supposed to see that, you know, we're not supposed to notice. Uh, while in Meskin playing a cross-dressing role, we cannot but notice. So there is something... And there's like a double standard in a sense in the way that these two roles, these two cross-dressing roles uh, work. Um, so, but nonetheless, or that being said, I think that there, this is a very courageous decision and, and, and one which has really interesting um, consequences on how we imagine the Messiah and how the Messiah can be imagined. Uh, and, and and again, as far as I know, maybe, for, I don't know if the first, but one of the first of its kind. Uh, so she, so I think, you know, she shouldn't have disappeared under that role. And I think that's part of the meaning of that role. And you should have seen that. But you don't see any traces of controversy or this being, you know. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, I really good long day. Um, <laughs> girls have started a class on um, alternative forms of sexuality and cross-dressing in planes. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a whole weird day. day. <laughs> so, Thank you so much. Thank you for reading me.